Welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode number 326. My name is Brando. We got two interviews for you today, two guests coming up later for Appetite for Discovery, one of our segments where we learn about uh, bands we may not know so much about, unless you're from Germany, re- regarding this one, Kissin' Dynamite. So we're going to be talking to lead singer uh, Hannes Braun and about a TV show he did with Slash and just their new music, which is just going to be a lot of fun to talk with him about. But first, Great White's Mark Kendall. Yes, obviously, they, Great White goes back so far with Guns N' Roses, the Alan Niven tie. We'll find out what they're what he's up to. Great White is on the, the road right now. We'll see what's going to happen with, with new music from Great White. So let's see what they're working on. Let's catch up with Mark. Talk GNR, of course. So let's not wait any further. Hey, Mr. Mark Kendall, how are you? Thanks, Brandon. I'm doing pretty good, man. You know, it's quite an honor to to speak with you today. You know, just I, I I have this privilege doing this this podcast and over the years on working in classic rock radio to talk to just people that I've been hearing your music for so long, and then now to kind of get to meet the person. So um, we're gonna have fun today, I think, talking, and I appreciate the time you're giving me. Sounds good, man. And so this year. I mean, you're. It's difficult. It's. I say this year, and I joke how the last two years feels like just one day, just really odd one day. But you guys are are pushing forward, you know, uh, like like a great white to be kind of corny with it. So you've been able to get in a couple yeah. of dates so far playing, you know. And while it's, you know, a lot of people are aren't sure, but you're you're trekking forward. So I'm just curious how those first couple yeah. shows this year have been going for you. Uh, shows are going good. Um... You know, I, as far as the pandemic goes, uh, you know, people, I think, have learned enough safety to where they feel comfortable uh, going out in public now. Um, I know we did a show with Sticks a couple months ago, and I didn't see a single mask in the crowd. I was like, and there was probably maybe 15,000 people. Ooh, okay. So, um, you know, uh, I think when it first came out, and there were so many people succumb to it. Uh, there was a lot of fear, but I think there's enough information out now, you know, with the uh, variants and stuff. Um, it's, I don't think as bad as it was. I know I got it, um, and I was familiar with all the, uh, you know, the chest cold and the fever and all this is stuff I've had in the past, you know? Um, so I was able to get over it pretty quickly, but, uh, so that's that. Yeah. We're out playing. Um, people are enjoying themselves again and you know, we're thrilled. I'm glad that you got over it. Cause I, I probably got, and we're not going to focus on this. Of course, there's so many great things to talk about, uh-huh. but, but I, I got COVID before it became COVID. And I normally don't, I thought I got the flu and I rarely get sick. So it's just been, it's been interesting. And yeah, uh, people are more, you know, whether you're, if you're vaccinated, I think it's just like with anything. And this is something yeah. I always, I always try to say, this is not a, even a political thing. It's a common sense thing. Just do what you think is smart. You know, what's best for you. Yeah. And I'll just say this, because when I went to go see uh, Guns N' Roses last year three times, so those are my first concerts since the pandemic, I happily uh-huh. I happily wore an appetite for vaccination mask. So uh, right on. So I, I hey, can I I'll say I'll tell you this. Sure. I also was sick before it came out, and that was way worse than what I just now dealt with. I I was sick for like. Five weeks, the longest in history I've ever just had a cough and fever and all the uh, symptoms that they said that you would have, everything but the lung attack. 
Mm. And I could not get rid of it to save my life. And at the very end, five weeks in, I I got into a Z pack, took a Z pack, and that finally knocked it out. But I couldn't believe how long that lasted. I, I was, never in my life I have I had the flu. Usually, I mean, right. that long. Usually, you know, you do the sweat it out deal and all, you, you know, all the stuff you chill sure. and all the stuff you go through. This wouldn't go away. I was like, whoa. Yeah, I mean, something's happening. And uh, yeah, usually with me, I always just, I sweat it out. I always say that I'm, I'm sick for a day, but that wasn't the case. But it just got me thinking, though, with all of, all of this, though, just for an option, if you guys aren't doing it yet, I haven't checked your merch store. You could sell yeah. great white masks and just everyone looks like a shark. You know, I know you're just minimizing risk and you look cool and I don't know, just just a just yeah. a thought. <laughs> we thought we, that was uh, talked about way a long time ago. We kind of just shot that down. Okay. We didn't want to feed into it, you know. Fair enough. Um, just there's plenty of masks out there and people, you know, we don't want to uh, benefit from masks. You know, oh, that's... I mean, if it was some kind of a charity mass thing and all the money went to charity, I suppose we could do something like that. But okay, um, I'd rather just, you know, deal with, uh, you know, playing guitar and watching people <laughs> rock <Right>. out. <laughs> I know all this extra baggage. I know just with trying just to do what you've been doing for years on top of everything yeah. else. So I'm glad that you guys are still uh, announcing dates with some other incredible acts like how far back do you uh do you go with slaughter with mark slaughter um quite far actually um i know mark from his very beginnings e even like when he was with vinnie vincent i think he was about 18 or 19 years old uh we were on the road touring and i went to i believe it was hammerjacks just on a day off and he was playing with vinnie vincent and so I've known Mark for a very long time. Uh, when we did our last album, you know, he lives in Nashville and, you know, we hooked up a few times and we do shows with uh, Slaughter and stuff. Yeah, Mark's a great guy. Um, he, he's really a good friend too. He, he's helped me with different things uh, to do with my gear uh, uh, because we both have Kempers and like he comes to sound check and goes, Hey, check this out. You know, <laughs> you got to try this or that, you know what I mean? He's, he has really good energy. Um, so yeah, I go way back with Mark. Nice. And, and what about, and, and Mark Torian has been on the show and he couldn't have been nicer. He was such a sweet guy. So I know you, yeah. you have some dates coming up with uh, the bullet boys and, and Mark. Mm -hmm. So do you go back yeah. also? I have to imagine you, were, were oh, you yeah, yeah like, were you playing the strip together? Like, how did you just, you know, what was the first time meeting Mark like? Do you remember? Uh, I know, I knew of him uh, years ago, actually. I believe I saw him at the Troubadour one time and he said that, hey, I can play rhythm for you guys and, uh, you know, I can sing background vocals and all this, you know. He, he was actually a guitar player. He could, he was, you know, kind of playing in that Eddie Van Halen style. Hmm. And then the next thing I knew, he was on MTV in this Bullet Boys band or whatever um, as a lead singer. So I, I was like, you know, really happy for him. And then uh, when we did a headlining tour for, I guess you'd call them mid-sized venues, you know, five, 6,000 seaters, we brought out the Bullet Boys and, uh, uh, another band called Steelheart at the time. I believe they had okay. uh, one or two songs on on MTV and stuff. And so that was that was a nice little package. Um, and I, I remember one night uh, the Cheap Trick guys came down and, and his band played uh, "Hello There, Ladies and Gentlemen" or whatever. And I, I think the guitar player came on stage with them. So. Yeah, that was a pretty fun tour. Yeah, Mark's a good guy. Right on. I see. I, I love this era because I don't know if you were able to tell. I mean, we met briefly just on Zoom, and or, or how old do you think I am? I'll just say I'm 38. So I just missed the, you know, the heyday of this. So for me, you know, someone who kind of 
didn't catch these bands in the 80s. I, you know, it's not my fault. My parents didn't get together earlier than they did. You know, it is what it is. But so that's right. I, I love seeing you getting together with these. Uh, you know, however you want. To, how would you? I guess would you define it? I don't want to say glam. I don't want to say well, arena I can, rock. I could tell you. Okay. I could tell you this. Um, as far as the generations, uh, we've really seen like the twenty somethings a lot. Totally. You know? It, whether it be their parents bring them down, you know, it's like, you know, with that generation of 20 somethings, they can actually say, hey, my parents aren't so corny. These guys actually rock. You know what I mean? You're right. To where when you get to our parents back way back when it was more we couldn't relate to their music because it was so far removed. Mm. So. At least, like my son has brought guys from his work down to our shows, and they're t they're going, "Your dad shreds, bro." And all this stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? I love and they're that. They're like thirty, you know. So, uh, but yeah, you know, it. it uh, I, I forget what your question was. Um, well, it was, I guess, how would you label yourself? I guess when your son, oh, you, you know, would, it would, yeah. when he's telling maybe like, if they don't know who Great White is, do they just say, oh, right. my dad's in a hair band? Like, like what? It, it's, no, well, as far as the fashion goes, I guess you could call us a hair band because we had long hair. And the same guy that was making clothes for Motley Crue, Judas Priest, White Snake, and about every rat and all of them was making our clothes too. But... As far as attaching hair band to the music, um, I told the journalist one time my hair has never written a song. You know? <laughs> so it, right. it's like I I play guitar the way I do because of the influences I have. You know, I'm a big fan of guitar. You know, I grew up listening to Johnny Winter, Album Lee, you know, Billy Gibbons, um, just. Uh, Richie Blackmore. I mean, you know, the, the guitar players that I listened to were, you know, Carl Santana, you know, guys like that just played from the heart, you know, played in the moment. And I, I just kind of gravitated toward that and, you know, kind of came up with my own thing. And, and so when you hear Great White, you're going, well, I hear blues in there, but they got keyboards. And so, you know, it, it, it's like when you take me away from Great White, it's just like blues hour, uh, and, you know, rock, rock and blues. And, um, you know, I like hard rock, too, but it always seems to have that blue overtone to it. So I, I would just uh, if I had to label our stuff, I would just say it's kind of, you know, it, it, it has the, the blues overtones, but it's uh you know, hook, we got hooks in our music because I, I think you're supposed to have that, you know, if you want to survive. Sure, to sing but, along uh, to, sure. We, uh, we just write the best songs we can and leave labeling it up to, you know, people that do that. But it, as far as calling us a hair band, I think it's a little shallow because unless you're talking about the fashion, you know, because... When you talk about the 60s, you know, you got beads, you got bell bottoms, you got, you know, long hair and flower power and all that stuff. So you could call that, uh, I don't know, flower power music if you want, but how can you call Hendrix flower power music? Right. You know what I mean? Sure. And so that's kind of what, to me, they're just labeling the entire '80s and just call it hairband. I, I guess it's an easy out for a journalist, right? It's know. kind of a disservice, and I think that's what's happening now with bands like Great White still on the road, and, and all that I guess frill is taken away, and they get to see you as musicians, you know, and not think about you know the hair that's all the way up there with the Aquanet, and that's why your son's friends can right. be like, "Whoa, he just he shreds and just thinks about the music." So. You know, uh, it's, it's yeah, absolutely, and that's what really our the fans are still there. They're still in front of the stage when we go play today, and they don't come there because of our hair. No, you know? no, of course uh, not. They, they, they come there because they, we grew up together, and they they've heard our music over the years, and and it it takes them somewhere. It takes them to a place, so they remember where they were when this certain song came out or whatever. Just like with us, we're fans also. 
there's certain songs that take me to an exact place. I know what I was doing, you know, I knew the smell, I knew everything, you know, exactly where I was when, you know, some ZZ Top song came out or Robin Trower song. I, you know, it, it, I get pictures in my head. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and somebody else that you just announced a, a date with, and I'm just curious how far back you go with, uh, is Vince Neal. And he's been out, he's been playing shows. Did you see Motley back in the day? Do you, Are you friendly at all with, with Vince, or you just kind of pass on, yeah. on the circuits? Okay. Well, I, I've known Vince since he was about, I think he was 15 years old. Wow. He, my, I was in a band that played at his high school, huh. and these friends of mine came up, and they pointed to him. He was standing directly in front of me, and we played at lunchtime at his high school. And a buddy of mine who I've known since childhood, he goes, hey, see that kid over there? He goes, he's, he's a singer, you know? And, and I go, oh, really? I go, what, what band is he in? He goes, oh, he's not in a band. He just likes to sing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like two years later, he was in a band called Rock Candy. And okay. we played in West Covina, which is a suburb of Los Angeles, at a teen center. And it was a, a battle of the bands. And um, he came with, uh, he got third place, his band and our band got fourth place. Huh. We, we had a 28 year old singer, you know, he couldn't quite hit the foreigner note and whatnot. And I, I remember the band that won, uh, they had this black singer that just killed it and they did tie your mother down perfect and everything. But yeah, so I go way back with Vince, and then uh, I guess one of the band members had seen Vince in Rock Candy. I don't know where they were playing, maybe the Starwood on a Monday or something, mm -hmm. and they stole the singer. So um, that's how Vince got the Motley Crue gig. Right. You know, I was really happy for him to get a proper gig like that. And to jump but, off that... And why, you know, you're on Appetite for Distortion. Of course, it's, you know, Guns N' Roses themed. And they're, well, you know, their early stuff was very blues based. Uh, I got yeah. to, this is, I'll, I'll give a credit to a listener who sent this in on, on Twitter when I announced that you were coming on. So he wants to know what's the story behind the credits of Slash and Izzy in the once bitten, twice shy booklet. I'm not familiar with that. So they're. Oh, they're, yeah. Um, well, what happened was our, uh, our manager managed guns, and uh, we had a, a, a hit record with with the album called Once Bitten. You know, it had Rock Me, and sure. you know, we, we got uh, some attention. And so we thought the obvious follow-up would be Twice Shy. And I guess uh, Izzy had come to our manager at the time, Alan Niven, and said, hey, dude, check out this song. You know, it's never been a big hit or anything, but it's called Once Fit and Twice Shy. And played it for him, and I guess he really liked the lyrics. You know, it's about being on the road and whatnot. And and so he, he presented it to us, and we thought it was fine. But we just thought it would be an album track, you know. And... The, the Capitol Records heard it and they just flipped out and said, that's the song, <laughs> and, you know. So we weren't really that confident, but um, we thought it turned out fine. And, you know, yeah. they're the big boys, you know, they're making the decision here. So, you know, let's just go with it. And then it kind of did what it did, you know, it took a life of, uh, of its own or whatever and did really well, so... You know, that that was the story. It was that simple that uh, Izzy, uh, not Slash, but Izzy is the okay. one that came with the song. And uh, and it became a huge hit. Uh, we weren't real. Uh, we were familiar with Ian Hunter only because. Uh, but it didn't have anything to do with us doing this song. But in the 80s, we played in New York. Well, first in 1984, we toured with Judas Priest, and our sound man was friends with Ian Hunter. Okay. And we went by his house and borrowed his drum riser that was in his backyard for the tour. And um, then later in the 80s, he came to our show that we did with Guns N' Roses, 
in our bus, you know, like using our bus for a taxi cab or whatever. And uh, so we had met him a couple times, but it didn't have anything to to do with us doing this song, really. And I was I wasn't even familiar with the song or his solo career, but I did know about Mott the Hoople, great band. Um, so, but I didn't know about his solo career, and I guess that song. I don't know. It was uh, marginally known in the UK, but was not really known here or something. This is just things I've heard. Sure. So that was that. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And you, you mentioned the the manager, Alan Niven, who has yeah. been on the podcast a few times and actually had the pleasure of meeting him last summer when I was visiting Arizona. Uh, long story short, you might find this funny. I threw up in front of Alan Niven. Back. Uh, I had car sickness. I, I had never been to Arizona before. I wasn't used to those roads. So that was my very cool anti-rock and roll meeting to Alan Niven. It was him rubbing my back, making sure I was okay. Uh, uh, right on. I, I guess I want to know, because he's been on the show, um, You know, what was that relationship like, uh, having Alan Niven as a manager, and I guess also having him be, be Guns N' Roses' manager? I mean, is there anything, you know, is there any story? Uh, yeah, what, what was that like, I guess? Well, um, first of all, you know, when we were up and comers, we were, tr our goal was to meet an Alan Niven at some point, you know, so we used to play all we could. We played ridiculous amount of shows and trying to put a, ourselves in a position to get lucky. And hopefully somebody would be in the crowd one night that could help us, you know, and, and we were lucky enough to run into him one night. Uh, playing in Hollywood and he gave us his card and we went and met with him the following day and the first thing he did was change our name <laughs> huh. and uh, but you know we uh, we just you know said basically you know these are some of the compromises you have to make when you meet the big boys you know so we were fine with the name change and um, as far as a uh, few years later I guess Tom Zuta who was an A and R man from Electra was friends with Ellen, and said, "I can't get anybody to manage these guys. Would you, you know, give it a shot?" And Ellen did, and so he had a couple bands on his roster, us and and them, and he was able to juggle it fine. You know, we we never had any jealousy. We we're friends with them. We only did one show with them. Uh, apart from there was a, a charity show that I played on stage with Slash one time. Great guitar player. Uh, really nice guy. The whole band are nice. And uh, so, yeah, there was never any, like, jealousy vibe or anything like that. Because we were kind of off on our own, doing our own thing, selling tons of records and constantly touring, you know. Yeah, because that was always an interesting thing that, you know, Alan help you know wrote and produced for great white and then he's got guns and roses at the same time and the same label and, and and rising at the same time but that was you know that was great that was a great time in music so everybody was kind of winning at that time and yeah just to look back on it it's 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 cool you know did you just mention that i wasn't even going to ask if you, there was any jealousy but i guess what did you think though of their of their rise and watching that did you expect that from them um well you know, Alan uh, is a really good visionary. And when he first played me a demo of them, I didn't really hear it like he did, you know, as far as like hearing potential and all that, um, because of the quality of the demo was so horrible. Mm. But he can listen and hear things that I can't hear. And uh, but when that album was finished, I was like playing it for my friends going, check this out. This is going to, this is going to be something big. I promise. And at first, I guess, um, Geffen wanted to stop everything at, at 250,000 and Ellen just went in begging to, you, you know, take slash around the country to radio and give them less Paul signed and stuff like <laughs> that and, and throw jungle back on the radio again, give it a second go round. Because by that time, the word of mouth was really strong. So 
So they really, uh, it was a grassroots situation. It wasn't like a bunch of money was put into them and they were everywhere. They, they kind of grinded it out and, and people discovered them through their music. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't anything by design as far as marketing or, you know, it, well, it was, but at the same time, it was the music that did the talking and contributed to all the success they've had. Because that first album was was just absolutely gangster. I mean, it, <laughs> it, it just blew minds everywhere. Right on. That, right on. I appreciate you sharing that story. And I guess speaking of music, because this was a few years ago now, I have your, your bandmate, uh, Michael Lardy, on, and that's when uh, Full Circle came out. So I guess... Other than announcing these dates, can you update us on anything Great White with, with new music? Are you working on anything? Yeah. Um, I've been writing a lot of music. Um, I've been, I, I haven't been, recorded it yet, but I'm about to. And uh, the other thing is I just got a, an offer to do this radio show once a week. Oh. And at first when I, when I was presented the offer... I didn't really take it serious. I, I, you know, didn't follow up, but um, it laid around for a couple of weeks and then I heard about it again. And so I researched it more and found out that it's free form radio and I can like get on there and play anything I want oh, there you from go. any era. And, you know, I miss that free form radio so much because everything's mm. pre programmed these days. You know, to where I can get up, get on there and play like Captain Beyond or, or you know, uh, you know, some old Bowie or anything I want. I don't know. It just sounded, you know, interesting and something that I wanted to, you know, if I can somehow be part of bringing back that freeform rock radio, <laughs> I want I want to do it, you know, and it doesn't really take a lot of my time. Uh, but the the station is located in Palm Springs, California, and uh, I've spoken to these guys a lot. And the first show I'm going to do is this Friday, and it's an hour show. But then the follow up shows are going to be two hours, so I can really dig deep and and present a lot of music, you know. So hopefully that does well, and it's just something to do in my spare time, but. Uh, mostly lately, I've just been concentrating on trying to write the best songs I can and uh, just going down that road. And, you know, I have this pipe dream that I'm going to write the greatest song of my life. <laughs> <laughs> even even though I might not get there, you know, that's what keeps me vot- motivated. I, you know, I have this vision that I'm really going to come with something, you know. I love it. So that, that's what keeps my energy um it, you know, vibrating at the proper levels it is, it, you know, not being just some oldies band or whatever, but somebody who's still creative and, and, you know, hopefully viable and can come with new music that, that makes people, you know, maybe go, wow, that's pretty good. Or, you know, I hate it or that's awesome or whatever, you know. I think that's that's amazing. And that's something to, to look up to, to inspire to, and to be influenced by, you know, that you're still motivated and there's no reason why you couldn't, rate, you know, create the, the best thing that you've ever created. Uh, I'm looking forward to all of that, you know, including, you know, being a radio guy. Yeah, I, I work, I've worked for and work for stations that are, you know, pre-programmed, talk, whether it's music, but that's why I kind of found this appetite for distortion thing where you got to kind of cool. do your own free form kind of, you know, so this, it's very rewarding and, I, you know, so I look forward to, to yeah. hearing you on the radio as well. <laughs> well, I, I totally appreciate what you're doing, Brandy, because you're part of keeping the music alive and keeping it, you know, in, viable and, and, you know, still talking about it. Cause I, I know when we play shows and I see all the faces out there, it's like, it, it makes me feel good because the music is, it, it it's withstood the t- test of time and, and people enjoy it and they can kind of relive their past a little bit. And I think it keeps you young, you know, to have the energy to listen to music. And, you know, I know it's a big part of my life. It, 
it's uh i'm the biggest geekiest fan you could ever know man <laughs> i mean i have my heroes like you can't believe that just blow my mind um i can't believe some of these guys play guitar as well as they do it, it just about melts my brain but uh right on when i get to meet when i get to meet these guys i'm just like uh, it, it, it's so exciting because what I've really noticed is the r super upper echelon, you know, that have sold like a hundred million records and stuff like that. They're so down to earth and peaceful and loving and, you know, and then if there's ever anyone that maybe not so nice and you're not really getting a good vibe from them, they're usually the guys that think they're supposed to be the guys that sold a hundred million, but they ain't quite got there. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but, but I, that's what I've noticed. Guys who are big stars or been labeled that way has nothing to do with them are always so sweet. You know, they're just the nicest people you could ever meet. And it makes me feel good. You know, I don't want to meet one of my heroes and the guys just totally won't even give me the time of day. You know what I sure. mean? Sure. And that's kind of what this podcast is. It's getting a chance to, you know, I, I get questions in from listeners. Sometimes I have them co-host the episode and it's meeting your heroes and it makes you enjoy the music more. And you're a perfect example of just how down to earth and nice you are. And you're, you're a geek for the music like we all are. So it's just, it elevates everything. So it's kind of just peeling Peeling away the layers of just, you know, a person yeah. or a band and that we may not know. We know of, but do we really know? So I kind of get to, you know, to meet you. What's, what's, what's great about your show is you're showing a different side to the artist. It, right. It, it's, they're, they're not on stage, you know. And um, me being a fan, you know, I want to know what, what does Billy Gibbons do on Mondays, you know, <laughs> during the week or, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, when he's not on stage, you know, because like I said, I'm the biggest fan known to man. And, and I think people like to hear from, you know, their favorite people, their favorite artists and, and see what they have to say and stuff like that, you know, something away from the stage. And, and I know I do. And so shows like this are, are good to expose that. And, you know, people can get to know us a little better. Yeah, right on. Well, it was, it was a pleasure to get to know you a little bit, uh, Mark Kendall. So this was a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're doing a lot of dates uh, in the middle of the country right now, so I'll have to wait for you to meet me on the East Coast here in New York. Uh, yeah. and, and for those, I mean, it might be worth a trip that Monsters of Rock Cruise with Alice Cooper, uh, Queens Reich, Tom Kiefer, who's been on the show, uh, Skeeter Rowe. So, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to see you're still killing it out on the road and uh, look forward to, to meeting you at some point. Yeah, just uh, uh, as far as the fans go, just go to our website, officialgreatwhite.com, and, and check. We're getting dates in every day, and just see when we're playing in your area and come down and uh, rock with us. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. All right. Thanks, Brandon. You got it. Have a great Keep day. Up great work, buddy. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Great White are great guys. And before I forget, I want to say uh, thanks to Jorge Boz. Uh, that's your Twitter handle, asking the, the story about the credits of uh, One's Bitten Twice Shy with Izzy and, and, and Slash. But, and, uh, and Scott Jones, also on, on Twitter, who kind of helped me just kind of segue into what was your relationship with, with Alan Niven. What was that? What was that like? So as promised, part two of our episode... Uh, second interview of the day with an awesome guy I can't wait to meet. And as we have listeners all around the globe, you know who he is. You know who Kissin' Dynamite is. Uh, Hannes Braun, uh, if you're from Germany or Austria or Switzerland, I know they're huge there. And shame on me. I, I didn't know much about him or the band until I got offered this interview opportunity and you know a chance to talk about their awesome music and the fact that they had a TV show back in the day and slash was a guest so i mean these are things that passed me by i've said since episode one i don't know everything so i'm gonna discover kiss and dynamite on appetite for discovery i just want to bury appetite that's the goal bury appetite for discovery i'm anxious to discover the badass rock and roll coming from germany 
Welcome to the podcast, Hannes. I thank you. It's a, a real pleasure to talk to you. And uh, yeah, well, you say something here in Germany, uh, we really got a good uh, revival of rock music coming back. And that's a big thing for us. And it always was because um, we grew up listening to rock bands uh, such as Guns N' Roses, for example. And that's our big passion. So we're really glad to bring it back over here. Yeah. And I wanted you to bring it back everywhere especially because you, you have a new uh, album coming out very soon um actually n not the end of the road which is not the end of the road for rock and roll i hate when people say rock is dead and i mean yes I've, I've been thinking to myself because here i don't know if it's the same in germany and we talk about this over the course of the podcast you know obviously when it comes to in in terms of guns and roses why they're they're famous in all these other countries i try not to have a very narrow mind i don't i know the world doesn't surround me here in queens new york i'm aware of that <laughs> so yeah. you know i i have listeners in germany i've had you know german people on the show i had uh a matthias uh, Jobs from uh, das scorpions sorry I'm, I'm sorry i won't do any german anymore that was terrible no no it was good <laughs> oh thank you thank well i appreciate that uh so i wanted to have you on because not just because you know, here in America, we're having this pop punk revival, which I was a fan of, which fine. But I'm like, there's still this arena rock that's just why isn't it coming back? You know, and that's why I've, I've had fun uh, having bands like uh, Steel Panther on, who you've opened for. So, But when I started doing research about Kiss and Dynamite, I couldn't believe this. So maybe before we even get into your TV show where you had Slash on as a guest... You started out as a as a school band, like yeah, that's actually true. Like um, I was, how old were I actually? I was um, seven and my brother eight when we formed the, well, you could say the very first band in the in the basement of um, the house that we lived in, um, and we, you know, we just had guitar lessons and stuff that my dad paid us and you know as uh, what what do you learn firstly on guitar it's pentatonic scales and that's that gets uh, quite boring uh, really fast because if you cannot play songs with what you learn then uh, there's no sense to it so we really wanted to do something with this information that we learned on on our instruments so we formed our uh, first blues rock band because we could play blues with these scales hmm. and uh, over the years it's developed more into a rock band and we found also a, a bass player and uh, that i started to sing was quite an accident because we had a terrible singer back in the days and i always felt ashamed staying uh, being on stage uh, and listen to his uh, terrible singing and so i just took over the mic uh, one night so we really started very very young and uh, it's a long uh, progress that uh, was taking place until we formed the final lineup for kiss and dynamite yeah and that's why and i admit it i never try to be too cool for school i know a lot about you know rock and the history but you know again doing looking up on uh you know your guys background and then you've also yourself have done tv shows like competition like we have so many of these competition shows and it always makes me proud because many of them go viral when you see somebody yeah. covering metal you know, that's like for some reason, like the biggest thing in the world. It's like, oh, my God, on this yeah. show, they covered metal. So how old were you when you were on? And what was the name of the, the singing competition that you were on in Germany? You mean like the casting show? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the name was uh, Star Search. It was a German uh, TV format that actually... Uh, yeah, tried to 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 be established within these competitions that are going uh, uh, happen all around the world, and uh, the the reason why I did that was uh, it was kind of a cool concept because there was not just a possibility for grown up singers, but also a category where teenage uh, singers could participate. And I always loved rock music. And back in the days, I sang my rock songs, like He Shook Me All Night Long, ACDC, Knocking on Heaven's Door, of course, the version from Guns N' Roses. And uh, I made it to the final back then, but I quickly found out that this is not the way of um, how you get um, famous as a rock star, because mm -hmm. it's this 
uh, glitter fake worlds of uh, TV studios and stuff. And I didn't like it um, after uh, the competition. I couldn't walk on the streets without being recognized uh, in Germany, giving autographs as an 11 year old. Wow. And so um, I overthought things quite a lot. And uh, back in those days, I was not even sure if I wanted to be an artist anymore mm. because all this fame was uh, hard to handle. But I guess that's just um, the fact that I was uh, just still too young to process all uh, the shit that was going on. Because um, then after a few years and I still had my bands in the background, uh, we wrote the first songs on our own and um, started uh, going on the search for labels and stuff. And I felt that fun again, being just a real artist and not a TV clown, you know? So that was uh, kind of cool for us. And when we received the first record deal with EMI in 2000, I don't know, eight, um, we really, made it the real deal like it should be with a record deal and um, starting to um, grow as a band with our own songs and that's not just those covers i love those songs still but i love more to sing uh, of course our original songs and uh, that made, makes me feel proud when i look back at all the history that we had Sure. I, I couldn't believe it. I wasn't sure if it was the same star search as, you know, like the famous star search with Ed McMahon back in the day. But I guess they have franchises just like American Idol and all, the, all these other yeah, yeah. shows. True that. And, True it, that. you know, when I read, I'm like, you know, age, you said 11 and, you know, ever know Wikipedia is right, but 12. I mean, yeah, that's that's fascinating. Yeah. And you took a step back too and realized because not many do, especially nowadays where. You know, everyone has a you know, TikTok. It's very you don't have to wait for a TV show, I guess, to become famous now anymore. And you're right when huh? it's some people aren't prepared for it. For, for so for you to kind of take that step back and you know realize and kind of reevaluate things. But obviously, we're glad that you didn't give up on music. Otherwise, we yeah, would. me too, me too. <laughs> but 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 back in the days, I was quite shaky. So I'm really glad that uh, I made it over this um, point, so to speak. Yeah learning experience for sure you know what and this is a good transition i had a similar conversation i had slash's son on uh, a few years ago he was 15 at the time mm -hmm. and he's in bands he's still trying to make it with his first band and and that becomes something and, and get out of the shadow of being slash's kid but you know obviously being just being slash's kid he's famous it's it just it is what yeah, it is yeah, sure. sure so but you didn't um stay out of tv but but you did it differently so tell me i couldn't find it online i'm sure it's because of, of tv rights in part, in part of the country or you know my part of the world the tv show that you had and getting slashed and tell me all about that please yeah well that was um a, a few years after this um con uh, uh, contest thing that i did um, so it was back in the days when we already had Kissing Dynamite in the lineup that it is, um, or well, that it was because our drummer left the band last year. But anyway, um, we had a name already here in Germany um, and we had three albums out already. And so that was a funny idea because Jim, our guitar player and me, we were uh, sitting a lot in the pubs of the country and, <laughs> you know, just having a good time. And one day uh, a lady stepped in, she was looking pretty hot. And actually that's why we started a conversation with her. And we found out that she's working for a TV station here in Germany. So uh, we got interested uh, even more in her, not just for her looks. And um, so she was kind of um, she was kind of uh, interested in us guys too, because we were like really crazy looking. We had the hair up, uh, you know, uh, makeup um, on our faces and eyes and stuff. Just to uh, you can imagine it like Motley Crue back in the days. Sure. And, and um, so we, we chatted along and um, so we had the idea in this very night at the pub uh, of working together and um, um, doing an own TV show with her. And uh, we called it Hair Force One. It was Jim's and my idea uh, because, you know, as I said, we had our hair up. Yeah, it's and, clever. Um, 
and and we wanted to do it uh, just a way uh, like we were living our lives which is quite which was on, and partly still is quite an excessive uh, intensive life you know with a lot of uh, chicks and um, all those glam rock cliches that you can imagine out of the 80s so uh, well it was clear that we have a lot of Leo print and stuff going on in our TV show and it was clear that we wanted to have all those artists that we loved back and still love uh, from the 80s and 90s so we couldn't believe when uh, after the third or fourth show we really managed to get Slash for an interview for our TV show because it started more or less as a joke um, format you know and uh, so we went to uh, with with our camera team we went to a hotel room in Berlin where he had an interview day and actually it was two hosts me and Jim but Jim couldn't speak anymore he was like too nervous to talk to Slash <laughs> because it's also one of his big guitar heroes and uh, I I was kind of brave enough to step in that room and real facing the real Slash sitting on a couch with his head and you know j uh, just how you imagine him and he, and and he was a really nice gentleman really calm and really polite and stuff and i felt stupid after the interview actually because i um only asked him stupid questions <laughs> or so i thought actually the interview was cool then and um i i had more the impression uh, of being stupid than uh, than i actually was welcome to my but, world that's every that's every second yeah, of my well, life <laughs> yeah well but really some uh, some questions uh, were do, uh, do too, you... too jokey i asked him for example uh justin bieber hey or gay <laughs> and, uh, and, and and he really uh, took it seriously and answered like gosh i guess this guy gets more chicks than you and i so i had to laugh about his question ex actually and um, nice. um not not being angry of what i asked mm. him so that's a real cool thing and i remember that uh, interview like it was uh, two days ago mm. so this will stay in my mind forever and he's a really a gentleman that's very cool and you're right yeah people can get i'm i you know for those who listen to this podcast especially if you wouldn't think that guns and roses is a hot button issue for some people but i get nervous or i i kind of you know had a had a phrase the question right but then you're just asking the silly questions which you should be able to do it should be a fun conversation and yeah yeah. People can get mad, and uh, that's, uh, that's yes. Well, well, and I didn't want to ask him only questions that uh, that everybody asks, you know. Right. And for also also for him, I guess that gets quite boring too. Yeah. So, and, and we had this concept of our t TV show. It was a really funny, entertaining TV show, and just asking the serious shit is not uh, like what we wanted to do for a show. So. Uh, Slash was very forgiving <laughs> for those uh, funny questions that I asked him. Yeah, I love it. And, and you know, another uh, German musician who I've had on the show, uh, Hansi Kirsch, uh, yeah. Yeah, from Blind Guardian, you know, I, he spoke about this. So I got to ask, so keep it on stupid questions. Did you see uh, the South Park episode where Slash was Wunderslash? It was a German folk, like a folk uh, story. No. Do you know what I'm no, talking about? No. Are you familiar with South Park, that TV show? Well, I, I know that, but I didn't uh, watch it. It's um, I, I was always more the Simpsons guy, but okay. uh, yeah, I, I heard about South Park. Okay, I'm a Simpsons guy too, but there was one specific episode of South Park where they just... Yeah. Because uh, Hansi said that was uh made reference to it so i just thought that was funny about you know slash is not real that's why you see him yeah. everywhere and he just turns out to be this <laughs> german folklore you know wonder slash and this is german song that goes along with it so i was just curious he's stupid question <laughs> but uh but you never know so you know let's transition yeah. to something more serious actually and this was very cool so as i'm looking through you know you, you have a bunch of videos up already so people want not just want to listen to you um, and, and just get a sense of what the whole album is going to be, uh, yeah. just what kind of people you are. So can you tell me the, the about the video and the song and the purpose for the song uh, Good Life? Which, yeah, a lot of well, it goes to charity. Great, great that you talk about it because that's a real important thing to us. Um, 
I, I tried to put it in a short story, but it's not possible, actually, because uh, years ago, uh, during our f- second album, um, it's more than 10 years ago, um, there was a, a boy quite um, next door. He was living mainly in the uh, same village that we lived, and uh, he was same age. And uh, His name is Tobias, and, and he found out that, that he suffers leukemia, like blood cancer. Mm-hmm. And that shocked us pretty much because it could have been us, you know, instead. Mm-hmm. So uh, we decided to do something. Uh, we we managed to put on a show where the proceeds should go to him and his family for, for the therapy. And it's a difficult thing because you have to find a, a cell transplantant first. And that's the tricky part of it. So that costs a lot. Um, you have to... Uh, um do all these testing uh, testings which are really expensive but long story short in the end uh, he really found a transplantant and he's healthy nowadays so that Great. changed something in our minds because um we we suddenly knew okay it's not much that we can do but we can do something wow and we never stopped um you know fighting cancer especially when it's um about children and we found out that there's an association quite quite near to the place where i live in in a german city called tübingen and they specialized themselves uh in in the in the fight against uh cancer when it uh, uh, comes to children mm. and so um after this incident that i told you uh we over the years did different things to support this association for example streams where we uh, that we put up um on the internet without taking money for it but uh, ask people to donate to this association uh, association and we felt like we want to do even more what's the next steps and so uh, this charity uh, song idea came to our mind and indeed um, the the song good life all those proceeds that the song raises um, go directly to the association and um, we wanted to raise as much as attention as possible so we asked our um friends colleagues that we have met uh, over the years and luckily we found three cool uh, guys and girls who would want to participate and this is uh Gernika Mancini from Thunder Mother a real cool all girl band from Sweden mm. Um, a band that you might not know is called Saltatio Mortis, but they are really superstars here in Germany. So, uh, and friends of ours. And uh, finally, Charlotte Vessels from XT Lane. So, I really, I'm really proud of the song. I'm really proud of uh, the cause, and I'm really proud of everyone's performance. I mean, this is just amazing. Again, I, at first, I was just, you know, blown away. I was sent this. You know, but one of my contacts, hey, you may be interested in this band. They did something with Slash, and and I was doing more research, and I'm like, wow. First of all, they, you guys sound great. Your vocals are great. Thank you. You know, Thank it, you. <laughs> I, I, you you have a new fan in me, and then when I started doing more research and just seeing how back or long your your history goes, when you were kids, you know, just like you said, and the good work that you're putting into it, you know, it, it's quite Thank amazing. You so much. You know, people can just say anything and, you know, yeah, let's uh, let's fight for kids cancer. But the fact that you you did something in your own. It's not like you're in the you're making the cure. You know, you're not going out of your uh, your realm. You're doing what yeah. you can. And you saw absolutely and you saw it work. I mean, it's not obviously it's not, you know, it's a sad case where it's 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 not like it's a guarantee. But the fact that you, you were able to help your friend and you saw like, hey, we can actually do something. And yes. you're still doing it. You know, I just think that's an amazing thing about, you know, not just you guys aren't just awesome rock and rollers. You're awesome people. And that's what. Thank I, you so much. That's the biggest compliment. And uh, to all those people who listen to your amazing podcast, I mean, it's really important to say each stream counts here. Like uh, if you want to support the cost that we support, then you have to stream the song Good Life or buy it, that's even better, um, buy the album, because also the, the, the parts of this song um, f- from the, um, you know, proceeds uh, from the album also go, of course, to the association. So we really want to do uh, something great here. And we want to surprise the association in uh, one week, actually, with a uh, quite a cool amount of money that we already raised here. We got to get you to open for Guns N' Roses. 
that just needs to happen. Oh, that that would be a big dream, actually. And we were always fighting with our booking agency over here in Germany when we found out that uh, Guns N' Roses is coming uh, for uh, some stadium shows uh, to Germany, because it has actually two reasons. The first and biggest one is I love Guns N' Roses. It's a shame that I didn't put on my Guns N' Roses shirt uh, for uh, for today. Um, and um, I also love uh, Axel's voice. I, um, I, as a kid, I tried to pretend uh, the sound that he has, but I failed miserably. But anyway, and the other reason why we would love to support Guns N' Roses in the stadium is the stadium. My God, uh, we, we never play the fucking stadium, you know, mm. and uh, combining these, these two things, playing with Guns N' Roses in a German stadium in the summer that that would just blow my mind. That's that's the biggest dream, actually, that we have. All right. Well, so, they're not stopping anytime soon. So it can yeah. happen. <laughs> they, they've been, they're really good with finding opening acts of just local bands and just bringing people. Yeah, they'll, they'll get, of course, the, the Lenny Kravitzes at times. I mean, the whole uh, Smashing Pumpkins thing didn't happen yeah. because of COVID. But you look around. Like I guess yeah, this past couple of years was a bad example because of COVID because it was just uh, Wolfgang Van Halen. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. when they first got back together, and you know what? Even going back when it was like Axel and and uh, Bumblefoot, he's just really good at finding local bands and elevating them. And absolutely, uh, I keep my fingers crossed. Still, I will too, man. I mean, you have a new again. I know you've been uh, you've been big uh, with the the Germans, you know, the German gal since you were a little kid. You know, I, I'm just picturing like little Hannes running, you know, with your long hair, looking like you were in Hansen, running away from the girls. You know, that that was the visual I got. But uh, by, by the way, you can still find a video on YouTube, um, me at the age of 11 singing "Knocking on Heaven's Door" to uh, to this uh, big crowd in the TV. You know, uh, like uh, millions of people watching the show. Oh. It's actually pretty pretty funny to to look at it, uh, even for me uh, now. If I look back to those days, awesome! I'm going to share yeah. that online. And that, and that was the that was the final. Actually, that was the last show. Wow, wow, man! I got to have you back on. I feel like this is more stories to pull from you, Hannes. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah, I will. Hannes Braun, you know, Kiss and Dynamite, the uh, the new album, not the end of the road, uh, available as of January 21st. A pleasure. You know, I know we're apart by seas and, and viruses by now, but I, I hope you, you know, whether I go to Germany for the first time or you come here to New York, I hope I get to see you and play in person. And it's been a pleasure, man. Absolutely. Likewise. It was great talk to, talking to you. So that does it for this episode of Appetite for Distortion. Thanks again to, to Mark Kendall and, of course, Hannes Braun of Kiss and Dynamite. Very cool, guys. And, and what's to come on the podcast? What can you expect? Well... I'll preface everything with the best way to keep up to date is on social media at the AFD podcast on Twitter, Appetite for Distortion on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, also, I, I update uh, YouTube daily, even if it's not a full episode. There are highlights uh, from interviews you may have forgotten about that I've forgotten about. So you can always check with that and communicate with me. Uh, but what does to come as far as guests are concerned? I can tell you a couple that are coming up. Sean Bevan, one of the producers on Chinese Democracy. I announced it on social media. You're already getting your questions in. So if this is the first time you're hearing about it, well, here you go. Again, that's why I preface everything with follow on social media. I'm going to try to get to as many questions as possible with Sean. I'm very excited to talk to him. And another episode we're going to do with two guests that we've had on before. But not together. So I think we're going to do something very special. So the first one, Chris Weber. You may know as from Hollywood Rose. Has credits on Appetite for Destruction. Goes way back with Guns N' Roses. He was on an early episode with, with Appetite for Distortion. And Marcel Circus, Who, you know, I say that like you. If you don't listen to the podcast, I'm sorry Marcel. She's a wonderful person. But you don't know who she is. She went to, She's a published author. But. For our purposes, she went to high school with Chris Weber slash uh, Steven Adler, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So she has great stories. And we did an episode with her, which is one of the more fun ones that we did. Some great stories of 
with with Flea and just like the, just to think about the high school versions of all these rock stars. So we're planning on doing a Zoom episode and we'll see what we can do with old yearbooks. Maybe we could find some yearbook photos of some of our favorites rock stars. So that could be a fun one. So just stay tuned. There's also going to be another guest, a, a surprising guest that's going to be amazing that I'm not going to announce just yet, but you have to follow on social media. Okay, so I'm going to keep pushing you towards there. So that does it for this episode of Appetite for Distortion. When will you see these episodes, the next ones? In the words of Axel Rose concerning Chinese democracy, you'll see it, I don't know if soon is the word. No! Fuck it! No! Yeah! Thanks to the lame-ass security, I'm going home. <laughs>